What is up you guys? So in this one, we're going to talk about linear independence. What does that mean? What are linearly independent vectors? How can we look at linear independence in different ways? So if we manage to find linearly independent vectors, well, why do we care? and how could we express it in different ways, right? How could you manipulate your vectors using this concept? We're also going to introduce a test for linearly independence through two examples. Where example one, we're going to give three vectors that turn out to be linearly dependent. Whereas in the second example, we're going to give three vectors that will turn out to be linearly independent, okay? So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so let's talk about linear independence. So it is worth noting that linear independence is very important. <laughs> it arises almost everywhere in linear algebra and its applications, and therefore we must definitely have a good understanding of what linear independence is. So first of all, assume that we have, let's say, M vectors as such x1 x2 down to xm right and each vector falls in rn so what does linear independence state well we say that m vectors are linearly dependent which is the opposite of linearly independent if we can find or if there exists scalars c1 down to cm that are not all zeros such that the linear combination of ckxk is zero. So if you can find a collection of scalars c1 down to cm such that this sum is exactly zero, then we say that my set of vectors x1 down to xm are linearly dependent, okay? So now, Given this definition of linear dependence, we can figure out an equivalent definition of linearly independent. So we say that a set of vectors are linearly independent if statement A is not true. That is, if for every set of parameters that are not zero, or for every set of C's, C1 down to CM, that are not all zeros, this sum is not zero, okay? So if you grab all scalars in M, so in other words, all the space Rm, you grab those Cs and you compute this inner product or linear combination, then guess what? Linear independence says that this should never be zero. Of course, except for one case, the zero vector, that is, all those c's are equal to zero, okay? Let me rephrase. So we say that a set of vectors are linearly independent if for every set of m scalars that are not all zeros, the linear combination between my c's and x's is never zero, except for one case, if you set all your c's to be zero, then of course, this linear combination is zero. Well, we're excluding this case just for the sake of proper definition, right? So what does that actually mean? You see this definition and you might be wondering, oh, does this have another meaning? Could I, you know, could I express this in a different way? Well, of course. Let's say you've got a set of linearly dependent vectors, right? So we're over here. So using this definition, you can find at least one C, call it CI, right? Let's say my CI is not zero. According to this definition, you can always find one C that is not zero. Well, let's say it's CI. This means that using this linear combination, let's express it as an expanded form, right? So C1, X1, plus let's focus on CI, XI because we're going to be needing this term down to CM, XM, 
and according to linear dependence, we can find such c's such that this is not zero. And at least one is not zero. Let it be ci again. Okay, so now what can we say here? We could say that my ci xi is minus everything else, right? So get all other terms on the right hand side, leave ci xi on the left hand side, and you'll end up with the following. So c1 x1, you're summing until ci minus 1, right? So that's the term just before ci and multiplied by xi minus 1. Then you'd want to exclude ci xi because it's over here. Then the term after ci xi is ci plus 1 xi plus 1 down till cm xm, right? Then you can divide by ci over here to get xi, which is minus 1 over ci multiplied by all the rest, right? Well, you can express this as a compact summation form by just saying that, okay, I've got my minus 1 over ci, right? But the summation goes from 1 to m except i. So for k not equal to i, right? So what does that mean? Why did we do this? Well, it turns out that, you know, over here we managed, thanks to linear dependence, to express the vector xi as a linear combination of the remaining vectors that are x1 down to xm except xi, right? In other words, it is depending on the other vectors. So what does that mean? It means that you can always find at least a vector. In our case, it is xi, thanks to ci not being zero. And say that my xi depends on all the rest. Actually, let's say you have ci and cj that are not zero. So it means that xi depends on all the rest, and so does xj. Okay, as a small example, imagine you've got four vectors, x1, x2, x3, and x4, right? And you attach to them c1, c2, c3, and c4. Well, let's say you manage to find c1 and c2 that are not zero, okay? and c3, c4 that are zero, okay? So this guy is a zero and so is this guy, such that this sum is equal to zero. So what could you go ahead and say using the, the first definition? Means that my four vectors are linearly dependent. Okay, what else can you say? Well, since c1 is not zero and c2 is not zero, it means that I can express x1 and x2 in terms of all the rest. That is, I can express x1 in terms of x2, x3, x4, actually only as a function of x2, because x3, x4 are 0. And I can express x2 as a function of all the others, x1, x3, and x4. Okay? Since c3 is 0, you cannot express x3 as a function of the others. Okay? Due to this choice of your c's, you cannot just divide by c3. c3 is 0, right? So this choice does not allow you to choose x3 as a linear combination of all the other remaining vectors, okay? So now a very natural question is, well, how do I test for linear independence? Is there a certain test? Could I follow a certain methodology and just, you know, use this methodology to test for linear independence? Well, of course. And it's all thanks to homogeneous systems. So I'm going to explain this through an example or two. Let's start with the first example. Well, let's say I've got three vectors, x1, x2, and x3. And you're interested in testing whether 
those three vectors are linearly independent or not. Are they linearly independent or are they linearly dependent? Well, according to the definition, the vectors are said to be linearly dependent if you can find C's, C1 down to C3 in our case, so C1, C2, and C3 that are not all zeros such that this linear combination is zero, right? So going back down here, could we actually find C1, C2, C3 with at least one of them not being zero such that C1, X1 plus C2, X2 plus C3, X3 is zero. Could we actually do that? Well, let's find out. So we could rewrite this linear combination as a matrix over here of X's. So X1, X2. Actually, let's write it down over here. Got more space. So X1 in the first column x2 in the second column and x3 in the third column multiplied by a vector of c's so i've got c1 over here c2 right here and c3 right here you can go ahead and verify that this matrix vector multiplication is actually this guy right here okay so could we find this such that this matrix vector product is all zeros could we find such a C? Well, what are we actually doing here? We're solving a system of homogeneous linear equations, right? We talked about this in my previous lectures. Actually, I've got a lecture on homogeneous systems. Anyways, could we find such a C vector that is not all zeros such that the following is true? Well, let's find out. So now the question is this, how do we solve this system? You can solve it using whatever method you wish, but let's stick to this course and this could be achieved using Gaussian elimination. So let's fill up this matrix first and try to find a row reduced matrix version of matrix X. Okay. So what is matrix X? Well, replacing the vectors X1, X2, X3, we get this matrix. And let's try to find a row reduced version of this matrix. Why? Because as we explained in, in the lecture of homogeneous systems and the lecture on linear equations, it is always beneficial to express the matrix of coefficients, in our case, the matrix X, in row reduced matrix form to be able to solve this system easily and normally using back substitution. Okay, so let's start with matrix X and let's first start with some elementary row operations. That is, we'll try first to null this guy out. How? Well, instead of R2, we're going to plug in R2 minus 2R1, right? And what that means is that R1 and R3 remain unchanged, right? But R2, now we're going to replace R2 minus 2 R1, that is 2 minus 2 times 1, that's 0. 1 minus 2 times minus 1, that's 3. And 7 minus 2 times minus 1, that's 9, right? Now we're going to do the same thing to null out 3. How do we do that? Well, that's easy. Instead of R3 or row 3, we're going to plug in R3 minus 3R1, right? That said, R1 and R2 remain unchanged. And R3 becomes, let's start, 3 minus 3 times 1, that's 0. 2 minus 
3 times minus 1, that's a 5. And 12 minus 3 times minus 1, that's a 15. Okay? Good. Now, what is our next step? It's to null this guy out, the 5. Right? How do we do that? Well, that's easy. We go down here. And instead of R3, we need to plug in R3, a scale of 5 over 3. Why 5 over 3? 5 over 3, right? The 3 comes from the second entry of row 2, and the 5 comes from the second entry of row 3. So once I do that, Again, my first and second rows do not change, whereas my third row becomes, so here I've got, I start with 0 minus 5 over 3 times 0, that's a 0. Actually, I don't need to go back because I'm sure that those two, that's in case you want to program or write some code that does Gaussian elimination for you. In case you finish from one row, you don't have to start again from the first entry. If you're at the third row, you start from the second entry, right? And if you're at the fourth row, you start from the third entry. So it's sort of a triangle. You're, you're trying to, you know, express the initial matrix in upper triangular form, right? So why on earth would I want to go back to the entries that I already nulled out, right? So in that case, you'd save operations. Okay, so we go back here, 5 minus 5 over 3 times 3, that's a 0. And 15 minus 5 over 3 times 9, that's also a 0. Oops. So, what does that mean? If you recall from the lecture on homogeneous systems, if I end up with a row of all zeros, what does that mean? It could only mean one thing means that there are infinitely many solutions to the homogeneous system. So what does that mean? It means that the initial system that I started from, this guy, yes, it does have a solution. And not only that, it has infinitely many solutions. So what does that mean? It means that the three vectors, x1, x2, x3, are linearly dependent. Okay, let's do another example over here. Let's say I've got three vectors, x1, x2, x3, where x1 is 1, 2, and minus 1, x2 is minus 1, 1, and 2, and x3 is minus 1, 7, and 12. Okay, and the question is, are those three vectors linearly independent or not? Or are they linearly dependent? Well, as we did in the previous example, we're going to form a matrix as such, right? But this time, of course, containing the coefficients of the vectors we have. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, is this linear homogeneous system achievable? Could we find C1, C2, C3 such that this linear homogeneous system is true? Well, let's start as we did in the previous example by the matrix of coefficients and see where we'd end up. Let's proceed using Gaussian elimination to null this guy out. How do we do that? Well, we'll start R2. We'll plug in R2 minus 2 R1, right? So the first and third rows remain unchanged, whereas the second row becomes 2 minus 2 times 1, that's a 0. 1 minus 2 times minus 1, that's a 3. And 7 minus 2 times minus 1, that's a 9. Okay, now let's try to null this guy out. So we've got our 3, we're going to plug in R3 plus R1, right? The first and second rows remain unchanged, whereas the third row becomes minus 1 plus 1, that's a 0. 
2 minus 1, that's a 1. And 12 minus 1, that's an 11. Now, let's null this guy out. How? That's easy. All you have to do is instead of R3, you plug in R3. Let's use the second row. So minus 1 over 3 R2. What do we get? So 0 minus 0, that's a 0. 1 minus 1 over 3 times 3, that's a 0. And 11 minus 1 over 3 times 9, that's an 8. Okay, so now, unlike example 1, we didn't get a row of all zeros. But what can we say? Well, let's solve this system. From the last row, we have that 8. C3 is 0. What does that mean? It means C3 is 0. Well, okay, C3 is 0. Plug it back in the second equation, you will get that C2 is 0. So now we have C3 0, and C2 is 0. Well, plug C3 and C2 back in the first equation, you'll also get that C1 is 0. And not just that, the solution is unique. So the only solution to this homogeneous system right here is C1 equal C2 equal C3 equal to 0. And what does that mean? It means that my initial three vectors, x1, x2, and x3, are linearly independent. Why? Because as the blue line says, for any C1, C2 down to Cm that are not all zeros, the following linear combination is not equal to zero. Well, the only three numbers or scalars, C1, C2, C3, that gave me a linear combination of zero, right, is the all zero vector, which means that the three vectors x1, x2, and x3 are linearly independent, okay? So that's about it. That's all you need to know about linearly independent vectors or on the other side, linearly dependent vectors. So they're just a collection of vectors that if no vector can be written as a linear combination of the others, we say that the vectors are linearly independent. That's another way of seeing it, right? As we saw over here. Thanks for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below. I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Also consider donating to my Patreon account any amount you wish. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in future lectures.